introduce this webinar series, Karen Lopez. Karen is a Senior Project Manager and Architect at Info Advisors. She specializes in the practical application of data management principles. Karen is a frequent speaker, blogger, and on data issues. She is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP specializing in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. She wants you to love your data. Joining Karen this month are our three esteemed guest panelists, Dr. Maureen Smith, an information management professional and consultant with broad experience across industries. Anne-Marie holds a PhD in management information systems and has earned the de designations of Certified Data Management Professional, CDMP, and Certified Business Intelligence Professional, CBIP, along with Project Management Certification. Anne-Marie serves on the Board of Directors of DEMA International is, and is on the faculty of North Central University. Also joining us today, David Lotion, President of Knowledge Integrity Incorporated, a consulting company focusing on customized information management solutions, including information quality and consulting training, business intelligence, metadata, and data standards management. David has written numerous books, the most recent being The Practitioner's Guide to the Data Quality Improvement. And last but certainly not least, Pete. Pete Stiglitz, a senior healthcare data architect at Proficient. He has over 25 years of IT experience, having worked in enterprise data architecture, data management, data modeling, conceptual, logical, physical, dimensional, data development, EDW, uh, data quality, BD, MDM, master management, metadata, data quality, and database administration. Sorry, guys, I'm getting right here. <laughs> Pete holds a mastery level certified data management professional, CDMP as well, and certified business intelligence professional, CBIP as well. So please welcome Karen and our panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Welcome. Great. Thanks, Shannon. That was wonderful. I also want to thank Dataversity for hosting these webinars. And if you haven't been to dataversity.net, you should head over there as soon as the webinar is over because there's a whole series of blog posts, webinars, videos, articles, and all kinds of great stuff. I know I just got back from Enterprise Data World in San Diego, and what an amazing event. I really enjoyed myself. Um, you should also consider going next year to EDW and actually submitting a talk. I think that would be wonderful if you would do that. I also want to thank Shannon. She's the rock star editor at uh, Diversity, and she makes all this magic happen for these webinars. I'd also like to thank CA Technologies of Irwin Data Modeling fame for sponsoring these webinars. Without them, we could not make this happen. And finally, I want to thank all of you attendees. What's really important and different about our webinars is that we encourage all of you to interact with us as well as each other in the chat. So the chat feature is probably in a sidebar over on the right of the WebEx, and that allows you to talk to everyone or to people privately if you'd like to, as well as there's a formal Q&A. And the formal Q&A is the best way to get your questions about what we're talking about or even really witty comments to our attention. We do try to read the chat. We do try to uh, monitor Twitter. But if you really have a burning question, stick it there in the Q&A. And you don't have to wait till we ask for questions. So get over there and get writing. Um, also, uh, there will be a recording of this made available in case, I don't know, your boss calls you away and makes you solve a particularly tough, tough normalization problem or something like that. So this month's topic is data modeling governance. And I don't mean data governance per se, but how do we model, uh, how we manage and govern and protect and extend and promote our data modeling uh, assets and all of the artifacts that go with that. We spend all this time in our enterprises, in our organizations, convincing the business that they need to do certain things to love their data, to protect it, to keep their customers happy, to keep their CIOs out of jail, and all of those great things. But I, a lot of times, and we're gonna, I want to ask all of you, all of you panelists, including the attendees, if we're not maybe more like cobblers or shoemakers' children in how we manage our data, or are we saying practice what we preach, but we're better than that, and we're not, we don't 
we'll just manage the data in a really in, our metadata and our models in a really informal way. So that's what our questions are going to be about. If you have a question or observation about data modeling governance, go ahead and get those into the Q&A. So I have an open question uh, to our three panelists of, do you think that data models, metadata, other system artifacts, gosh, I think Shannon's uh, tongue twisting has is, uh, do you think our data modeling and data management artifacts require the same level of data governance, stewardship, enforcement, compliance, measurement as what I'll call the real data? Uh, I think I'll start with David. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, I, I guess I could use an analogy, which is uh, if if we're building a building, I would expect that all the tools that I use would would conform to some level of standard so that I, I would uh, not expect that after the building goes up that the girders suddenly start buckling uh, because uh, we didn't we didn't institute some level of standards now that said uh, you know I think you're, it's interesting because your question should we or have we and <laughs> I, I think that because we are still in a uh, in a maturing phase of our industry where we're, we're continuing to at some level of, uh, you know, some navel-gazing leading to self-awareness. Uh, I think that we haven't, because we haven't focused on, on need for that level of, uh, of, of governance, uh, and now that we see that we've gone for 40 years without having as much as we needed, uh, it uh, seems to be a little bit of a, of a dilemma. Yeah. So it's funny, you started out with tools, and I thought, what a fabulous analogy, because I thought you were going to go the way not just of the girders and the components of a building, but also the hammers, the wrenches, the air impactors, the cranes, you know, things that don't become part of the thing we're building, but the things that help us do the design and building of it. Like one of the things that I know about engineering governance is that while engineers use CAD CAM systems and design systems and lots of computing software to do their designs and, and their tests, they're still professionally accountable for um, all the work that those tools do. Like It's not a practical defense for a licensed engineer to say, well, I did all my work right. It was an error in the software that caused the beam to be under-specified. Mm -hmm. yeah, when you ask a question, the image that I had in my mind was a, a hammer that, that was shattering when you actually when yeah. struck, struck a nail. And, and, you know, that would be intolerable in, you know, in the context we were discussing. So so that we uh, we seem to have some some degree of laissez-faire when it comes to the same for for the systems we use to okay. make a lot of stuff. Excellent. So, Anne-Marie? Before we get your thoughts on it and your great analogy that you may or may not have that I just put you on the spot for, uh, <laughs> what do you think about that? Have we had a laissez-faire attitude towards tools and methods for the parts that we do? Yes. I think that most of the organizations that I've been involved with have, uh, I'd say, less than a laissez-faire attitude. I'd say they have an ignorant attitude. That uh -huh. they either don't know that architecture and modeling have governance, or if they're told they should have it, they exist that need for a variety of reasons. I think that the maturity, as David and you, Karen, have both pointed out, is an underlying cause for the ignorance. Uh, unlike professional engineers who have a knowledge that has grown up for millennia, engineers have gone back to at least the Egyptians with a set of best practices of the data management community. Although we've had that long, they can't claim to have rules that go back that far. Um, of awareness around the need for governance. Many people who come to this profession came to it from other Good and point. The lack of an understanding of the need to have 
certifications and education in the aspects of data management, including data architecture, means that many people are ignorant of the need to have governance and practices in development of models, management of them. So they are using how that will shatter. Right. Models that are soft. Yeah. So really that will buckle. Right. No, no, with, with a logic there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, so Anne Marie, I just want to to clarify. So, my guess is you're using the word ignorant there more in the cognitive sense, and not in yes. sort of the common, uh, you know, kind of wisdom of stupid, of capable of understanding, though, right? I'm using it in the cognitive sense. Exactly, exactly. So, I think that's an excellent point, and I put down another question to follow up on later. So, Pete, we're now two for three. Um, okay. What are you? And also, um, if you have any other comments about, um, so I want to know, do you think that we're doing a good job governing our models and all the other, and I'm going to use models today, I mean, I don't just mean ERDs and modeling files, but all the stuff we use, all the components of what we do as data architects or modelers. What say you, and also, do you think, because, it, well, actually, I'll just let you answer that first. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's definitely a, a lack of uh, governance around models, and I think you know it's a uh, you know part due to ignorance. But then there's also been I think with the push for for agile, there's there's a big pushback on some people consider uh, models to be documentation about documentation. And I don't know anybody who does documentation just for the sake of documentation, but uh, there's a purpose for the documentation, uh, or at least there always should be. But uh, yeah. so I think you know, there's so there's you know some pushback. Uh, you know they need push to get things you know done away. You know maybe you know, some of the management uh, of the model and governance of the modeling environment you know set to take a, a back seat, which is unfortunate because you know you to and really be agile, you want to reuse. And leverage the models that you've already developed. You know, uh, you know, as you you get caught in the trap of, of finding the same thing multiple multiple times, giving it different names, and then of course you have uh, the enterprise disintegration that we have. You know, we've got you know twenty different names for the same thing, and so uh, you know, you know, I think definitely that the data modeling environment and the data models. Um, you know, is, is very important and needs to get raised up to the level of, of the data governance board or committee uh, that you have. And I, I think a lot of people are really uh, understanding the importance for governance. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, governance of data, you know, governance of models, maybe so much, but it really needs to get escalated to the level of, of data governance to make sure that, you know, are good practices in place. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's always critical to have. A data modeling standards document. You know, you have modelers going off doing, you know, doing models in, in different ways, and so that leads to hmm. you know, uh, uh, you know, lack of standardization. Right. So one of the things is is that um, so you have a document, and what we know from the data governance world is that writing a document and throwing it up on SharePoint or some enterprise portal um, doesn't make it so. Right, it's not if you write it, they will follow it. Have to have, you know, and it has to have some teeth to teeth. It has to have some teeth, of course. It has to be yeah. somebody has to be measuring and ensuring compliance. Yeah. Uh, you, and so, how much do you see that? How many um, in the real world? You know, I, you know, not, you know, not, uh, not too frequently, but it's something. It's something that I always emphasize, uh, you know, with my clients. As I come yeah. in there, and it's like, oh, you know, we don't have a standards document. And when I ask them, and it's one of the first things that that I that I develop, because uh, otherwise, you know, it, it helps me to make sure: am I doing, you know, kind of what they're looking for? Uh, am I complying to, you know, the standards they have now? I mean, you know, even though those standards might be spread out all over uh, documents or in people's heads, 
at least yeah. collect you know some of those standards, then uh, you know I know that I'm, you know uh, meeting their expectations. And then of course down the road, you know other people leverage those standards. Mm-hmm. Aren't we so handicapped by by that we do our job, which is you know it's it, it's you know, I'm, I'm reflecting back on what I said before about building and building standards. And Anne Marie commented that you know there's thousands of years of, of of best practices. We don't have that, and we also you know like we most of our buildings pretty much look the same. You know you know mod some 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 you know dentive stuff on the outside, but you know every skyscraper. You know, fundamentally, is is, is uh, you know steel steel girders on, on in the guts and and pretty much standard. While everything we do is all based on on some some typically different requirements uh, that are that are distilled out of conversations with non-technical people who don't understand the difference mm-hmm. between what 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 and they want to see and the, mm-hmm. the desire for 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 the input that goes into it. So I mean. Maybe, maybe you know, it's hard, it's hard to impose a set of standards when when it's not clear that those standards are always going to enable us to to, to address the, the needs of 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 the the people who are driving the right. The and and you know, sta- standards, okay. of course, you know, always have to they always have to be you know flexible. If you try to nail standards down, on there's there's a way nobody else's you know everybody can be leverageable for your projects. You know, so you have to have it. You know, you don't have to be a you know a hundred page document or anything like that. But uh, you know, give you some teeth. And, and there's she, the, you know, the enterprise data architect or data manager. Uh, you know, should be responsible for making sure that that the that the uh, standards are being adhered to. And of course, you have to have flexibility. You know, because it's it, it's not always going to be you know the same. You know, in one case, you might be doing uh, you're doing transaction processing, you know, with the normalized modeling. In other cases, you're doing star schemas. That's right. the flexibility. So I think since we keep coming back to this uh, building analogy, I mean, the reasons. So, David, you said all buildings are mostly the same. No, I'd say all buildings in places that have formal building codes that are actually measured and enforced, all buildings tend to be the same, or all bridges, you know, they don't look the same, they might have a huge variety in design approaches, fundamental differences between a suspension bridge and and a cantilevered bridge and, and all the other types. But the reason we have those is because people were harmed and killed in the past. That's why we have licensed professions. Um, and you know, I don't get into the whole licensing of the software world thing right now, but um, that's one of the reasons why we have those, that buildings do have common traits, and, and we have not only the professionals who have to uh, measure and in, try to enforce, but they also have the backing of, of uh, building codes that are statutory-based, as well as standards of practice, plus um, sort of weight of of liability behind them, and as we've seen in other locations in the world where there might be building codes, but they're not enforced, or there's no building code at all, people still continue to be harmed. And I wonder, Annie, what do you think about that analogy? Do you think, um, you think part of the issue is is that um, we don't have any authority as data folks? Karen, you must be a mind reader. <laughs> because that's the sort of that's where I saw your train of thought could be going. Um, mm-hmm. One of the challenges I see that we have in the modeling world, specifically and in data management generally, is that we don't have the authority in most organizations for that management. We can recommend procedures. We recommend that best practices that we've seen work in places where we've had authority, and those places could be like raisins and tapioca pudding, few and far between. <laughs> uh, but organizations, we don't have the authority to enforce that, not without result. All companies. I don't use just for-profit companies. I'm sorry if I, I yeah. should not use that word. Um, yeah. So as a result, I had a client recently where 
because of the complete lack of any data management standards, starting with their data architecture. Their data was such a mess that they are in serious financial trouble and are in serious legal trouble as a result. Pure and simple. Right. right. And so um, I wonder if management, you know, one of the I always say on these webinars is that we date people are well, technology people in general, but I think we data people are terrible marketers and are terrible at expressing our value statements and being able to draw a distinct line between a company in trouble or a company's finances or a company's profit or customers or what it is through the products that we produce. We're terrible at expressing uh-huh. it uh, and all of those things. So what could a data architect do, a lonely data architect in the mass of a vast corporate framework infrastructure do to try to draw those lines? I think that, you know, this is Pete, uh, I, I think, you know, it, you know, architect can only do do so much. There has to be, you know, some ability. And again, you know, I think data governance is is the way to raise that, that visibility. Uh, I'm just, you know, data architect, you can start implementing some, some best practices uh, and try to use influencing uh, you know, capability, but uh, you know it does become very hard. And and you know, at the end of the day, there's only you know so much you can do. I mean, you, you can bark at the wind only so long. And um, but you know, I think you have to you know raise the visibility. Um, I think you know, data governance will help us to have better data modeling governance. Excellent. So um, you know, I think there's part of that. There's part message. And everything, but I want to ask all my panelists, including you audience members, is what are the parts that we should be seeing implemented in um, a proper data modeling governance, data management governance, whatever we want to call it, environment? So I'm just going to throw out data modeling tool because I, a real data modeling tool, um, because I can't see, you know, even beginning to do this with drawing tools or spreadsheets on an enterprise level. But what else? What else needs to be there? And Pete, you brought up standards documents, so you know that's policies and standards. But what else? Um, well, I'll jump in here, which is which is where there's an opportunity to standardize for characteristics of of you're using, such as as you know, meta metadata. You, you know, I'm, I'm kind yeah. of term, but things like like unit measure. Like like uh, uh, standardizing uh, the 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 refs information and and how that corresponds to uh, to to conceptual conceptual main so that so that you don't have the problem of having to re, re, continually redefine the concepts as you uh, as you move from system to system. I mean, we have a a, a good example that we use often, which is. Uh, uh, pulling examples of definition of state from the United States uh, federal uh, documents, and how, you know, like every single time there's the use of the term state, there's another qualifying term that says that, you know whether it includes uh, you know territories, whether it includes Alaska and Hawaii before they became states. You know, like if you have to continually refine refine a concept, then you you can't even get to the point of, of, of using it in a, in a standard way. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, a really great point because I'm glad you brought up, you know, reference data because most modelers aren't involved. Most modelers I work with don't think they need to be involved in managing something like reference data, even though reference data can be implemented a ton of different ways, right? It could be in a table. Mm-hmm. It could be in an XML. It could be in drop downs, you know, in the code. That's very common with states. Um, and the fit anyone could change that architecture in just a minute's notice um, and put it somewhere else that we don't even know about and it never gets updated again. I mean, that's kind of like, Anne-Marie, what we were talking about in the pre-show about chairs being changed beneath us. So right. uh, that's difficult. Um, someone at Q&A, Gil Aware, has said that one of the things is we need accountability for data within the project, and I think that's important as well. So, and David, you're bringing up metadata and meta metadata as much as I also cringe at those phrases. One of the things I remind data architects is that this metadata, these models we're playing with, there are data, 
right? So the whole thing meta is really about perspective. So a lot of times I have trouble getting all of our tools and databases, our repositories and Mart's use and everything treated just like other production systems, even though they're our production systems, right? They're developer right. tools, but a developer's tools is their production. They're not writing development tools. It's their, it's their production. It's how they do their work. Exactly. And, and one other thing that I would I would add, this is Pete again, that uh, you know I think for enterprise data architects, it's, it's very important that you know you start building or you know or or fleshing um, out your enterprise data model, I mean, because that's a very Im important reusable artifact you know, to help drive standardization. Um, you know, you know, of course, also modelers should be try should be they should be reusing elements. You know, you know if, if uh, you have the same, you know, you know, tools needed, you know, we don't have to design redesign a, a new table. We we leverage that existing table definition in our models, and so we try to reuse model elements wherever possible. And I think you know, with regard to uh, uh, reference data, you know, that, that's um, you know, I'm, I, I like having this. Distinction of, of metadata because if, you, if everything is data, then it, it 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 can it can be kind of hard to talk about it sometimes and to distinguish, especially when you're talking with uh, with your you know you know business people and with other mm -hmm. technologists. But um, yeah. uh, if you know, like with you know reference data, you should try to document in your models uh, what is you know in order to understand you know like a, the reference. You know, uh, you know, a state. Well, which by state is it a um, is it a uh, United States state? Is it a transient processing state? And so, having, you know, the the values uh, enumerated, you know, wherever when you can uh, within the model metadata uh, is a very valuable uh, to do. Well, one thing that I think people one thing that I think people overlook when they're talking about the concept of data governance is that in an organization that has data modelers and or data architects, whether they're different roles in the group or if they're the same role with different titles, it doesn't matter, is that they should be involved in the development of the data governance pro program. Too often, organizations silo functions and don't see the benefit of action between parts of the data management community. One of the things that I try to do in, in a data governance initiative of any size is to make mm -hmm. sure that the data modelers, data architects are involved in the data governance program because a lot of the yeah. knowledge of the data, both yeah. the definitions, the usage, the features, reside in the data modelers' heads. I said earlier, a lot of stuff isn't documented. So rather than try to drag out from wherever sources, using leverage that exists from the data modelers in the organization makes the data governance program development go so much faster. You know, I'm going to disagree with you. Okay, uh, excellent. Because, because I think cool. that, that that most of the knowledge is 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 implicit. And and so you know this is, and this goes back to something Pete said, which is which is seeking to to do model reuse or model element you know element reuse is very different when you are the person who is defining the item as opposed to somebody who's who's using it. And you know what 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 people do they look around you know if they are encouraged to do model reuse, and we've seen this in things like uh, like Neem or the, or its precursor. Mm -hmm. in the, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the just, Federal uh, data architecture. Right. No. no the, 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 ju the justice XML model, where the, the yeah. enumerated catalog of data elements, but the rule was you could set and you could re redefine it. Yeah. So there's this, this 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 presumption of the ability to reuse it, except that number one, you can reuse it, you can pull it off the shelf, and then you can just tweak it a little, little bit. And you, you know, while you claim that you're reusing it, you're actually creating a new thing, and then yep. you let's say you you know let's use the the, the government 
uh, analogy a little, you know, take it one step further, which is now you've, you're responsible for creating some kind of transparency data set and you dump it on data.gov mm -hmm. and somebody else comes along and looks at the, col the set of columns in this, in this table and without the, de the definitions that, of, that were used for the processes that were creating this data set that may have pulled data from five different data sources, all of which has slightly tweaked definition. And now, now I'm a user of that, that data, I, I don't even care. I'm going to reinterpret state as to mean what I think it means, not what, mm -hmm. what the five, five data architects or data modelers thought of when they built the original system <laughs> who were involved. And in, in the interaction process, so so yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the data is not there. It's in the it's a, in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, it's David, don't that's involve, a, that's it's good. Don't involve the people in the organization <laughs> who are data architects at all. In your governance program, you won't know what anybody meant, especially in companies that never did any documentation. What right. I've walked right. into quite a few times. But there's and one thing, thing one, one thing I'd like to throw out there is, oh, sorry. Well, Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, one thing you know, I you know, I would like, like to. This is, is, I think, this is highly related to data models, but uh, I think it's very important. And I think companies are realizing that they really need to have a business glossary. Well, of course, you want to try. Well, you want to strive for you know standardization. The reality is, it's not going to you know all happen. You know, you pack package applications with, which have their own names and. People call things by different things, and you're not going to, you know, rigidly enforce one standard across the enterprise. I mean, if, and that's great. In most cases, that's not going to happen. But we, you know, if we're using a business glossary, we can, lever, you know, match these business terms and then match them down to, you know, implementation names. You know, so we have, you know, customer, you know, call something customer, but over here they call it an account, and this department they call something else, and this system is called, you know, X Y Z. And so forth. So, business glossary uh, is, you know, is a very important concept, and uh, that can help, you know, where you can mm -hmm. document that. Because now, you know, if, you know, that enables governance. Uh, trying to govern your information assets, if you don't know where where, you, where they are, uh, you know, then you, you can't really govern them. And uh, right. like I brought up, uh, data gov with Atlantic Web, and I think uh, the Atlantic Web can really help us uh, walk across uh, terminologies very. easily. Right. I it's think a very powerful. That's the, the, the okay, hold on. I'm the moderator. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. I think it's great that we have this really fast, engaging conversation. I love this. But I want to throw in that I, I think the glossary thing is great, and we're starting to see a lot of the modeling and, art, and architecture tool vendors really getting a good understanding of that, as well as mod, modelers understanding that an ERD for a database design or build or package project is not the same as a business glossary. So I think we tried that in the past, right? And I think yep. that's really great. So I'm seeing progress in our profession. Um, but I step back and, and ask sort of this other question. What are the um, situations where we don't need data model governance big, or big data model governance, I should say, in the lingo of today? Um, you know, with what I call and what I see a lot of data modeling via email. So there's no repository. There's no version control, configuration control. Every modeler or or developer has their own data modeling tool or database design tool, and then just sort of email files around, um, or something less structured and everything. What are the situations where that would actually be a preference? If the universal consultant answer is it depends, when are cases where that depends? It depends. Go ahead. <laughs> It really depends on the environment. I really think that I see that working a agile development group to first stages of development. It had very experienced, loving, data-oriented developers who were accustomed working with process it's very fluid 
agile in the initial stages. But I think I am enough of a data management purist to say that once you hit some level of, let's say, H2, where you get the years involved for testing, that I'd be yep. less calm with that. Okay. David? I don't. I, you know, I can't answer that because, you know, I have to balance practicality with, you know, with, 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 you know, the, uh, the, 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 the academic approach, which would say, you know, always govern everything. But, you know, I say, you know, those guys set, got, got together in their, in their garage to start to launch that, uh, that new business. They didn't sit down and start, start laying out an enterprise architecture. I mean, they uh, they did what they needed to do in order to make make things run, and right. and you know, you're, not. you're not you're never going to get to that point where everything is is always going to be perfect. You have to have some level of you know, controlled chaos that allows you to to you know, if you're going to uh. clamp down on everything, then 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 you'll rarely get get you know. Mm -hmm. You did have an answer. That, that's great. So, Pete, I'll say you know that um, you know there's, there's been many times I've had to do data modeling by email, and you know um, you know leading a team to develop industry data models, you know we were forced to uh, you know send model files back and forth, and you know it's not not ideal, but uh, again you have to work with the, the constraints of of your project. Um, you know, one thing I always emphasized if, you know, if I had to, you know, was going to send a model off to somebody, you know, for them to make changes to it, you would email the team and, you know, let them know that, uh, you know, Joe or whomever, you know, they've got the lock on the model file. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we should be staying out of that model file or at least not making any, any changes. You know, so many things. That work? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's tough at times. Uh, it is it is tough, but you know you just have to kind of work around it. And, and of course, really, we have a, you know you'd have a data modeling repository where you can do team based modeling, and you can have you know locking down at at, a, at an object level rather than locking the entire model. Yeah. But um, right. I'd also like to comment on the multiple tools uh, question as well. Like, um, you know, the time you you want to try to strive for a single modeling tool, but you know some you know uh, caveats to that. I would say, you know, some data modeling tools, uh, you know, have better consult data modeling capabilities than you know, others. And so sometimes, you know, so sometimes some of the modeling tools are really good at logical physical modeling, but not so good at conceptual modeling. And mm -hmm. I've ran into situations where I can model multiple inheritance in a conceptual model uh, through the tool. Uh, so I had to, you know, kind of do that. At, uh, using an enterprise architecture tool or or some other kind of tool, but uh, yeah. so yeah, well, you try point. to try for a single tool. So um, you know, I'll answer this because I tell the project teams I work, I don't trust myself enough to do that way. So even I mean, even when it's just me modeling, I still have to have a repository. I still have to have version control, and I think. There's a reason why things like Google Docs and SkyDrive, where you know you have versioning, automatic versioning, and you can check things up and check them back in, that's just a Word document or a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint that you can do that type of governance on in a in a distributed collaborative environment. That um, you know. I do that for my own files even, to, and I'm the only person updating them, and I still need all of those features to protect me from myself. So, um, you know, my answer to this data modeling by email question is I tell my project teams that are pushing back on that extra few hundred dollars per seat that it costs to have a repository to just acquire the license anyway, it's going to pay itself off probably in the first 90 days from all the rework that has to be happening and all the comparing and merging of whole files and the misunderstanding 
things and the accidental deletions and all of that stuff, that 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 cost is easily quantifiable. And we could write a business case for that in probably 15 minutes just by using, mm-hmm. you know, some standard rates and everything. And and to me, that's, you know, the right tools for governance. I do any of this governance that way of the actual modeling objects without those tools. The models are just too big and complex, even a simple model. That's, 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 yeah, that's definitely the, the ideal. It's not a philosophical, or David used the word academic ideal. I think it's a very, very practical thing. I mean, we ask our developers, even though they love Notepad and Emacs and you know all these text editors to do their work, they're still big fans of version control and and have control. And they're and they're agile people. They don't want to use too much process, but they know that we're humans and things get open. Emails get opened out of order and. People forget to include people in the C, and people don't read their email or, or something like that. That I think the first step to solving a data modeling governance program is getting rid of email as an architectural tool. To tweet that. See, I agree with that. <laughs> but that yeah. I'm a process-oriented person, and yeah. I'm an instructor, and that's why I press the governance probably. It's probably so, yeah. And, Nature and nurture combined. Yeah. So my question to the panel and to the audience is, so one of the of, of governance, of data governance, is monitoring when things don't comply. And I know in our analogy about a building, um, you know, an architect or engineer not only does a design, but they have to go out and review the things as they're being built, not after they're built, but as they're being built on a regular basis to ensure that the intent of the design is being followed, and where it isn't, you have to document it as well as approve where it deviates. And there are really valid reasons why changes from the design process have to happen as things are being built. You know, you run into some physical characteristic of, of the land or water tables or uh, materials that have been substituted or any of those things. Uh, but they have to approve of those and then have to document their approval and issue new designs that incorporate that. And that's a highly iterative process, so it's very agile. But it's still a measurement and compliance and enforcement. And they can order designs that have uh, implementations that have deviated to be corrected in some. And that correction might not match the original design. Um, so we don't usually... Most organizations don't give data architects that sort of enforcement power. So what should data architects that don't have the power to do that, what part of that process should they do? I, I, you know, I would say that you know, the, you know, I like that analogy very much of you know, the architect you know, reviewing the, the work you know, as it's going, just looking at the finished product. Uh, I think the architect definitely needs to be a part of the, the project team, and uh, I think in most most projects that I've worked on, that's been the case. It's not you know where you know, so that in a project you should always allocate some time you know for your modeler to be involved, uh, and I think you know most people you know projects I've worked on most time they they allocate some time to the modeler because you can't just model something and then just Turn it over to the development team and then walk away. It's uh, it's just a you're, it's just a recipe for disaster. And uh, uh, so I, you know the the data tech really needs to, you know, if not part of the project team, you know, need to escalate that with the, with data governance, uh, you know, with the application team, uh, application management. Uh, so. I think you know, shouldn't just uh, accept, and they should, that's something they should try to try to change. Um, that's a good point. Anyone else? Approach that that we, that we the guidance that we give in our consulting projects is that th- that kind of of engagement has to be there. Has to be a fundamental change to the system development life cycle to take into account that level of 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 interaction and engagement and, and essentially validation. Because mm-hmm. it's 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 a change in you know within application and function focused and not data focused, 
now that we're that we're seeing that 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 was perhaps a mistake, we have to change, right? So it's, that's a change management activity, and 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 maybe you know it's not the most uh, glamorous uh, activity, but the, the data modeler or the data architect should should insinuate his or herself into to the uh, the, the the SDLC. You can we'll let you do all that as long as you make it go faster as well. So you okay with that? You know, honey, that you say that. I used to when I was <laughs> first. First uh, uh, career was was developing compilers, and I was actually working on the optimizer for the compilers. And I used to say, you know, they, the, the the customer would always come back and say, "Can you make this run faster?" And I say, "Yeah, I can make it run really fast. Do you want it to run correctly, also?" Mm -hmm. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point because one of our Q and A comments was, "What aside our governance process based on the um, risk, the economic risk to having bad data." The one thinks there's any risk of having bad data. I think, right? That's right. I think. Was, I, I, the I, I think. I to convince a, a that I had the one that actually had the severe financial issues. They did not see the financial and economic challenges that were staring them in the face. Were too data oriented until it was too late. Um, they think, well, if we do this fast and we do this with full, everything will be fine. They did not see that their fundamental challenge was really data-oriented, despite our best efforts to show them that they had no data, and as a result, the data was lousy. The quality yeah. data was lousy, and that was costing them millions of yeah. dollars. So they stand the link. And the link. Did not understand the link. You know, one um, uh, client of mine uh, up in Canada, actually, but they uh, they hired you know a a business consultant to come and do business process reengineering. Uh, so now this process, you know, it takes so long for everything you know to get done, and uh, we're having problems trying to close at the end of the quarter. And so they brought this this business uh, consultant in, and you know this person has realized that. You know they don't have a process problem; they have a, a data problem. How much of their process was out? Okay, I get the data, you know, from the from the, from the base, and then I have to into a spreadsheet. I need to make some changes in the spreadsheet, then I need to send it over to somebody else, and and so you know, many of the process problems are are really at the core data problems. Described as the other way around. I mean, the, it sounds like the the core of the data problems is a process problem. Trying to re-engineer all their processes, but well, by getting their data house in order, that simplified their business processes. Because a lot of then you see a lot of you know the effort, the eighty percent of the effort is spent on fixing problems as opposed to delivering value chain or whatever buzzword I'm supposed to use there, actually doing their job right. But so. go back to your question about what we have the right tools for what we're attempting to do. Sometimes the best data and governance can show that we still have really significant data mo data quality issues. We have the best data models in the business and we still have lousy data. As data practice pr points out. <laughs> but what we find, you, you know, like I'll go back to what I just said, which is which is percent, if not more, of the time where there's a data quality issue, it's data's fault. It's the process fault. It's the fault of the process. And that mm -hmm. you know whether it's whether it's not governed or whether it's you know nobody ever checked to make sure whether that that you know that extract actually happened today before it, it loaded it, you know, six, for the sixteenth day in a row into the data warehouse because nobody noticed that, that the other thing didn't work. You know, we see this all the time. Or the fact that that it's really easy to to dump data into Excel and then use that on a PowerPoint and then somebody else draw some conclusion from that where you you know you're only are you you know you're reliant on on there's no oversight of the of the chain of chain of control of that data. So you know the model you know whatever the model is, I mean you're you're you are 
if you institute any level of governance, that's a tool. That's uh, that's you know that's a set of policies and processes and and socialization and engagement and and buy-in you know from the people that that you know, it's not the data modelers that you need to get buy-in from everybody else. That's part of the point of cultural change that we were talking about about five minutes ago. That the FC has the data modeling much later in the process than they really should be. The data architects really need to be at the very beginning of the engagement engagement project ever than of the whole SDLC process at cultural change because so long people didn't love the data. Right. They love it. That's we have a, a great um uh service that from again that all business projects should have a portion of their budget tied to data management as part of their business practices. So I like the yes. sprinkled business throughout that um because I do think of what we call IT projects we should really be calling business projects unless they are um you know pure infrastructure things and they should still be to the the business that should be the motivation and reason but generally mm-hmm. most of our IT projects are actually business projects i think a lot of people in IT don't realize that they see them as code projects or database projects or something like that um but i think it's a double edged sword is that if we have budget tied to data management that also implies a whole bunch of an accountability so what if we have three data modelers and 130 business projects going on at the same time and we've budgeted for them in the business projects, but we can't recruit all them. So one of my last questions, we only have a few minutes because I want to make sure we have some wrap-up time, is um, we've always complained that we weren't funded for enough positions, but I'm seeing the pendulum swing. Is, is data model governance also impacted by the fact that I know a lot of companies are having a hard time finding real, experienced data management professionals? Well, in the Philadelphia area, there's a little call for senior-level data management professionals. Okay. I can't answer that. Okay. Anybody? I incumbent upon these organizations to hire consultants to come in and help. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. All in favor? I think that's part of the, yeah. So I think that's part of the problem is, is most of the senior people I know in data management that have real hands-on experience and a good data domain have almost all moved into the consulting business. Um, so when I say there's kind of a shortage, I mean, you know, people who are willing to take on full-time regular employee work or what I refer to as a real job um, is – they are having a hard time. There are consultants and everything, people like all of us right now on this, this webinar. But um, I think I'm seeing, you know, that I've called 2013 year of data um, because the pendulum is swinging back to data because of big data and open data and semantics and all this heavy emphasis on data. Um, and I think there there is a shortage of experienced people, and that's why I'm seeing job ads that call for people with 15 years of experience. I used to never see that. Um, so we do good data governance if all we've got are people who've never done data modeling before. I think you know, have to do oh, – go ahead. Sorry. Well, in, in real projects being called on to, 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 to data modeling from – from 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 scratch. I mean, in most environments, they're not they're not building new things. They're they're enhancing exist, existing things. I still consider that, that data modeling. No. Yeah, but but it but it's it's not you know it's not uh, you know, exp, it, it's it's different a different a spin on it, right? It's not it's not building yeah. something from 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 ground level. It's it's uh, it's like a friend who's an architect who works for the uh, the, uh, the the architect of the Capitol. I mean, the, building that thing from scratch, they're just like painting. Painting comes yeah. in the middle of all of it. <laughs> but it's but it still requires architectural you know oversight to make sure you know if we oh, if we paint a you know uh, with a certain you know type of capital or whatever you know what kind of a problem is that going to have? So you still have to have architects and modelers involved and. And so, say somebody's trying to 
you know, and you know what, you know what do we currently? You need to have somebody who can explain what data assets we have currently, uh, and then how we expand them, reuse them, and, and build on them. Uh, I mean, many times you're not building something. You, you know, uh, you don't have a greenfield, uh, you know, development project, but you still have to understand data, understand the model, and be able to, to apply it. And Chat brings up a good point that we are still, and I do see this, building data marts and also data warehouses from scratch a lot. Absolutely. Query. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep going. I know that's a, and I think, you know, it, you know, to address the, the shortage, I think, yeah, we have to, again, you know, keep raising the, the importance of data. Some people are, are focused on, you know, application development and, um, it's you know some, sometimes it's, they see the, the the value you know in data management and the data modeling and uh, and so we need to keep the importance of data and then uh, you know into you know encouraging people with a really solid analytical skill set you know to, to encourage them to move into that uh, into the role and and then you know of course provide the the training for that. We're down the last three minutes. Oh, go ahead. One no, I, was, I was going to say that the, the tendency to have a lot of data modeling done by action development also seems to limit the capabilities of building robust data models by people who may not have been schooled in yeah. data modeling the way they were in generations past. And little anyway, so I, I definitely true. agree with. That. Yeah, so we're down to our last three minutes or so, a couple minutes. I wanted to ask each of our panelists if they have any closing, very short takeaway blurbs, taglines, anything about data model governance uh, for our listeners. So let's start with Pete. Okay, uh, so you know, again, data models are critical aspects in and of themselves and they, they need to be managed and governed, you know, for and um, uh, I think minimum every organization needs to have a data modeling standards document and uh, um, and again treat it as the data model as a, an information asset if it has your um, you know uh, your capital edited in Anne Marie? Models need data governance. Perfect. David? Uh, I guess I would sum it up, you know, the perspective is that you've got to, you've got to drive your governance in relation to, to being able to satisfy the needs of, of your users. And if you can't make that, that link, then it's very difficult to establish the value proposition for doing any, any, any type of governance. And I think people need to practice saying that value proposition as well. Practice home with their kids and their pets and everything. It comes down to the last minute. Um, we're to uh, really close the webinar and turn off the recording and everything, but everyone's invited to stick around for the next 15 minutes or so where we can kind of do some less formal talking about these things and continuing the conversation though. I, I wanted to thank Shannon again for pulling this together and Tony Shaw of Dataversity for making sure all this happens as well as CA Technologies for sponsoring it and their product is Irwin Data Modeler so you should definitely go check it out since we're talking about data model governance. Shannon did you have any closing comments? Just want to reiterate those sentiments again you know a big thanks to CA for sponsoring because we just enable us to provide these webinars for free. And to our panelists, you guys, this was a great conversation, very energetic, very very active, and, and thanks to everyone for attending. That button. Oh, the recording is now officially off.